Okay, welcome back everybody. We're on to week two already. We got to know each other a little bit. Uh, learned I learned a little bit about you and your, your writing skills and and how you form. Uh, so I'm pretty pleased with the way things went. I know that uh, it seems like a waste for many of you, but it really helps me gear the rest of the class. So I appreciate your indulgence on that. We're on week two and I call it planning, but it's really only partially planning. It really is the basics and the fundamentals of physical security and what it really means. So um, we'll go on and talk a little bit about planning and physical security plans, and then we'll talk about the elements of a physical security plan. And um, I think you'll understand a little bit more about how we go about laying things out by the time we're done with this week's uh, lecture. So I guess if I'm asking you to consider a physical security plan, I should kind of tell you why. Well, why do we plan? It keeps us focused and organized. It makes sure we don't miss things. When we actually write out a formal plan, it tells us what we need to do, when we need to do it, how we need to do it so that we cover all the bases. Now, can you imagine going on a trip, just going to the bus station and just saying, okay, I'm, I'm going on a trip. Uh, you know you want to go to Chicago, um, but you just buy any bus ticket. You know, you walk up to the counter and they say, okay, where to? Oh, I don't care. Just sell me a ticket. Then you get on any bus and you go and you hope for the best and hope you'll end up in Chicago. Now it's, you know, now almost February um, and Chicago is a little bit colder even than Pittsburgh in many ways because it is the windy city. And um, I will tell you that I got stranded in Chicago one time. I was taking a train uh, after all planes were grounded in New York due to a blizzard. Um, but the Midwest wasn't experiencing that blizzard. So I decided I was going to uh, hop a train in Penn Station and get a sleeper car and come home to Michigan that way. And it took me through Chicago, where I was supposed to change trains. And I got within about 25 miles of, of Chicago, somewhere around South Bend, Indiana, a little closer, maybe even. And the tracks cracked from the cold. <clears throat> it was that cold. The metal tracks just cracked. And so I ended up getting into Chicago, missing my connecting train that would take me back to Michigan. And because that's how trains work, right? You have to go past where you're going. You can almost see your destination out the window, but then you have to go another 100 miles and come back. And by the time I got to Chicago, it was too late. So I had to spend the night in Chicago and I grabbed a, a room at the, the Westin downtown. And um, it was three below zero at the warmest, not counting the wind chill factor. It is very cold. So now we're going to you know, hop on any bus, hope we get to Chicago. And just in case we do get to Chicago, on the off chance that one bus is going to Chicago, Illinois, we get off the bus with our Bermuda shorts and our Aloha shirt and some sunscreen because, you know, we didn't do a plan. I mean, it's February in Chicago, but we didn't plan. We just packed whatever was light. And so you have to have a plan for anything you do of substance. And there's no different when you're planning physical security for a facility, a building, a site, a location. And really what we're protecting are places, uh, although you will hear me say we protect people and products and resources and reputation through physical security. We do that by protecting the place where all those things are contained. And if you don't plan properly to do it, then you will just go about willy-nilly and you will miss something that an adversary will not miss. So therefore, having a plan is really important. So in physical security, just like many other things in security, we use a risk assessment. We have to know what is at risk. What do we have that somebody else may want? And how much would we lose if it were compromised? We have to do a threat assessment. We have to understand what could harm us, right? If we have something that is really, really valuable to us, but it's of no value to anybody else, then, you know, the threat is low. Um, so we do a risk and threat assessment. And we take those two things and then we look for the, for the difference between the two. If we have something that's very valuable and somebody else may want to take or harm or alter or otherwise compromise, and we know that there is a threat actor that would do that, we look to see how they might do it and where the holes are. What are we not doing to protect from that particular threat? If we know the threat is, it doesn't have to even be a security threat. If we have um, a stockpile of gasoline, well, we know that fire and gasoline don't really mix. So our risk is that we are sitting on a million barrels of crude oil that's going to be made into gasoline. And our threat says that um, there's a campground next door and it has open fire pits, right? Uh, I don't know who would plan that, but it's there. Our vulnerability would say that we need to do something, put something between that campground and us that would be used as a fire block so that sparks from those open flames would not get to our refinery. 
Those are the vulnerabilities. From that, we devise a physical security plan. We understand what we have, what could harm it, understand what we are not doing or what we're not doing fully that might allow that to happen. And from that, we devise a physical security plan to protect that asset. So a physical security plan, it matches those risks, threats, and vulnerabilities to actions or mitigations. A mitigation is something that you do to close a security hole. That's all it is. Uh, I have a front door on my home. A mitigation to the security of anybody being able to open that door is the lock. Another mitigation may be a deadbolt. A third mitigation may be that I have dogs. A fourth mitigation may be that I have weaponry. A fifth mitigation may be that I have an alarm system. Those are all mitigations to the potential for someone to come in my home through the front door. And so a physical security plan takes risks, threats, vulnerabilities, and you turn them into actions, which we call in this, in this field mitigations. <clears throat> Pretty simple stuff. You've probably heard it before. They should be written out, and you risk each major risk. And that is really in terms of what your assets are. Identifying your assets... And that tells you what may be at risk. If you don't have anything of value in your home, why would you spend an awful lot on a you know high cost deadbolt? Of course, you're protecting yourself, so you know there's one reason. But I think you understand you wouldn't put a safe in a house if you have no valuables to put in the safe, right? So you match your risks and your threats and those vulnerabilities. I in my home have a safe because sometimes I keep things that I consider to be valuable in the home, right? Don't come rob me, guys, because first off, you're not getting in the safe. And remember, the locks, the deadbolts, the dogs, the guns, okay? Um, but I think you understand the whole concept of risk and threat and vulnerability. And your written out plan is going to talk about how you close those gaps. A big thing to remember is without a written security plan, it is very hard in industry and in corporate security to get any budget to close those gaps. If you go to your boss and you say, hey, um, you know, the locks on the on the front door of the building, um, you know, we need to put more heavy duty locks on there. The first question they're going to ask is why? And the second question they're going to ask is why? And you know what the third question is, why? You need to tell him perhaps that it's because the current locks are not very strong. They could be compromised. Inside the front door, we have these things that could be compromised, right? Inside the front door, we have the room where we keep the valuable diamonds, right? And we have a standard lock on the door and we don't have a deadbolt and someone could use a ramming device to get in there. So what we want to do is harden that front door and put in a heavy duty deadbolt lock that a ramming device could not get beyond. But if you have that plan in writing and it's holistic and it covers your entire building, it is much easier to go in and ask for a big bucket of money to close all of your security mitigations. So a physical security plan helps you get budget. Now some people, and, and I'm of this camp, I often do a drawing first. I understand where the, the risks are. I have my asset list and I know where in a building they are. And I have a threat assessment and I know what could be, what could be done to it. So then I understand what my vulnerabilities are, right? If I have, again, that room full of diamonds inside the front door and I have weak locks, then I know that a vulnerability is the doors and a mitigation would be to increase the strength of the doors and the locks. I sometimes start with a drawing. I use a building drawing and I understand those first three elements, the risk, the threat, and the vulnerabilities. And then I draw in things I would use to close those gaps, draw in my mitigations. From that, I write my site security plan. In this course, we're actually going to do it that way. And I don't know if we're going to get to the point where we're actually writing the plan, because all it is is a narrative of what your drawing is. But the drawings tend to be a little harder for some people. Once you've done them a couple of times, they become very easy. And again, that's why I do them first. But understand that you can do a drawing first and back into a written description of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And it's a normal practice. The one thing I do want to touch on, and it's a little bit, not quite off topic, but it was in the reading this week, and I, I think it's something very important when you talk about mitigations. Our authors of the book, they're in the never camp. You never sacrifice security for convenience, and you will hear people say that. And I think it is a really great bumper sticker, but I'm not quite so sure it is um, even feasible. 
and I'm of the camp where we use reasonable and responsible risk taking. If you make a minor concession on convenience, sometimes you get better compliance. Okay, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Okay, the key is making sure that you mention the convenience in your physical security plan. So I could put a heavy duty electronic lock on my front door and I could have a single key, one key. And now I know that I'm carrying the key and that I'm the only one that can get in. I've closed that mitigation pretty tight. Now my wife is not gonna be really happy when she comes home and finds out that she has to sleep on the front porch in Michigan in the middle of February. It's gonna remind her of my Chicago trip and she will be reminding me when she goes in and gets those weapons we talked about earlier. So sometimes you have to have a convenience and more than one key to a door is a convenience item, right? I mean, it's a practicality thing. More than one person needs to get in the home. Therefore, you have to issue more keys. And when you have more keys, you have more vulnerabilities, right? It does, does take away some of the security when you issue a lot of keys. But the authors will tell you that you never sacrifice security convenience. I'm here to tell you that that is simply not practical. And in a business sense, it's not practical either. So um, they're the never camp. Uh, for this course, we are going to make reasonable and responsible decisions sometimes on concessions. So, you know, it would be very good when we go, when we do our drawings and you'll see that it would be really easy to put a camera in every room in our warehouse when we design it. But I will tell you that the, the uh, president of the company, his office is in the warehouse and he is not going to take kindly to being watched on camera all day. So I will potentially lessen my security by taking cameras out of his office for the convenience of him not wanting to be watched because I know who butters the bread, right? So again, you, you have read in the book, never, um, I'm not of the never camp. We should actually be thinking about responsible risk taking and sometimes, sometimes making concessions for convenience will raise the chance of compliance. So let's look at an example of that. So in this facility that this is a, just a random facility, the facility will contain employee records with personally identifiable information in room 212. That is a risk. Personally identifiable information is information I could use to potentially become you, right? To steal your identity. Uh, it would probably be employee records with social security number on it, uh, home addresses and telephone numbers, perhaps a picture, enough for me to go someplace and apply for a driver's license in your name. And companies have this on you, right? I mean, they have... I mean, they certainly know your bank account numbers if they're going to put your money in the bank for you. So they have a lot of information. It's personally protected information, PII it's called. And those of you who are in cybersecurity know that know that well. But let's just say we put those records in room 212. So the threat would be compromise of PII can result in identity theft. And that would subject the company to some liability. You gave me personal information and I didn't protect it. I have a responsibility to do so. So the threat is compromise of that information. We know our risk and threat. The vulnerability is that the room needs to be accessed. Somebody needs to go in there. The human resources people go in and out of there several times a day. So maybe my physical security measure would be an access card reader with secondary identification, right? Authentication rather. So a numerical keypad. So you all have used cards to get in and out of dorm rooms and other places on campus. They make those where you put the card in and then you also have a keypad and you have your own four digit number you punch in and then pull the card out. And if you don't have both the card and the number, the door's not gonna open, okay? That would be proper protection for PII, a two-factor authentication, if you will, badge and keypad. We're physically protecting you. However, we know that those HR people go in and out all the time. So in order to allow for convenient entry during normal working hours, only the card will be required right? It's a little slower to go in and then get your code, right? So they're going in. If I don't do that, and then at night, I'll turn it back on, right? And all the entry doors will be alarmed if somebody tries to, to breach the door. If I don't make it a little bit more convenient, there is a very good and high likelihood those HR people will, will prop that door open during the day. If they go out any more than four or five times, they will simply prop the door open. Now I have no protection on that PII during the day. And at night when they leave, if I don't have a guard service, that will go into an alarm state and it will alarm and tell me somebody's breaking the door and I'll have to send the guard or a police or whoever to go see that somebody put a rock in front of the door or a doorstop or a book or whatever they shoved in there to keep the door open. 
So I compromised security by only having that single authentication of the badge. But I increased it because I increased compliance. And now I know that the HR people understand they have to use their badge every time they go in. And I've made it a little easier for them during the day when they're there. And I also understand the, the building is under better observation when there are more people walking around during the day, less likely somebody's going to try to break in that room during the day when people are around. So oftentimes we compromise security slightly for convenience because it helps us in, it helps us with compliance. We we allow people to have a little bit of convenience in exchange for them being highly compliant on the things that we still require them to do. So one of the things you may have noticed is I needed to know what was going on in room 212, right? In order to do a risk assessment, I had to actually know what was in there. And that comes from a review of the risk and then a review of the threat, what could transpire, right? The threat of somebody compromising their PII and, and stealing their identity. And the vulnerability was that if the room is open, someone could do that, right? So the vulnerability is closed. The mitigation is lock the door somehow. And in order to do that, I had to understand that that room was lockable. Now consider the fact that you may be doing this. And in fact, in our assignment for this semester, you're going to do this from afar. You're not actually going to step foot into our warehouse that's being set up. You're going to do it from from drawings. And I often do this for drawings from buildings that are on the other side of the world. What if room 212 is an open room? I just didn't know it. It's just all I knew is room 212. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Physical security plan, put a lock on the door, put a keypad on that uh, door with an uh, with a access control card. And during normal business hours, it will be card only. After hours, it will be card and keypad, and I'll alarm that door, and I've closed my vulnerability. Except what if it's an open room? What if it, room 212 is technically just a little alcove with no door on it? What if there's no door, right? One of the big things to remember when you're doing a physical security plan is either you need to be on the ground at the site or you need to have up-to-date and very specific drawing plans. And if you don't understand those plans, you need to interview and ask people questions. One of the big things that people make a mistake in when trying to do physical security plans is making assumptions that something can be locked, making an assumption that what if the door were a set of double doors? Now I need to consider, you know, does one side open? I, those of you who may have worked in or seen hospital doors before, a door in a hospital room normally is a two panel door. You open, or it's either a really wide door, which they've kind of gotten away from, or it's a two panel door where it's a standard door and then there's a panel that has little clips on the top and the bottom and you can open that too so that you can get the bed in and out, right? If the patient needs to be moved in bed. And what if it's a double door? If I put a card reader and an access um, um, card on there and, and a keypad and an alarm, somebody could just open up the other, the other side because I haven't done anything with that. That, that leaf on the that free floats, right? Um, so if that gets left unlocked, somebody could just walk through that and I would never get the alarm. I have to understand it. So one of the things you need to remember when doing a physical security plan is, is ask questions about the drawings if you don't understand them, or preferably boots on the ground, going to actually look at everything that you're going to suggest a mitigation for to understand whether or not it's even possible. So I feel like I've thrown a lot at you so far. And we're only in week one. But these are pretty basic concepts, really. One that's not so basic is SEPTED. That's Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. And this is used when you're doing physical security for a, normally for a new building, but you can do some retrofitting. And uh, we're going to go, when we talk about perimeter protection in the next uh, couple of weeks, I think we're two weeks out from perimeter protection, um, we're going to talk a lot about SEPTED. And it's not something you generally use inside because it's the physical environment, normally of the exterior of the building. And there are some things you can do with the outside of the building that become security features that no one would think are security features. That's really what crime prevention through environmental design is all about. So if we're gonna talk about SEPTED, let's think about um, some common features of buildings. It is very common for buildings, office buildings these days to have underground parking under building parking, right? You use less footprint on a piece of property. If you have a small piece of property and you wanna get the maximum size um, number of floors in a building that you can put in there, you know, maximum use, well, you put the parking underneath the building. California, very famous for that. Uh, almost all buildings in San Diego, when you go downtown, have underground, under building parking. 
uh, which just blows my mind because of the earthquakes, but that's the way it is, right? Uh, how many buildings do you drive by that have full glass front buildings, right? I mean, most office buildings, they want a lot of glass. They want a lot of light. There's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, some of it's energy efficiency, really, because with low E glass that they can put in buildings now, you know, it's pretty insulating. Now you're going to use the power of the sun coming in to help warm your building. But who normally gets the offices with the glass in the front of the building? An executive, right? Schmucks like the rest of us end up in the basement or the middle of the building. We can't see up, but the guys with all the power, they sit on the fringe and they get to look out at the, at the nice scenery outside. And in many cases, it's not the top floor. If you have a you know single level building, which is fairly common, the executive is normally in the corner office with the biggest windows. And people then can park right up to the edge of the building. If you have a single level, you don't have parking underneath. Now the parking goes right up to the edge because you want your parking to be convenient, especially for your visitors. You want them to be as close to the building as possible because they're your guests. You don't want them walking a long way. Perhaps it's raining, right? And then you have these nice flower beds along the walkways. You want lots of color, right? Nice, nice flower beds in the springtime. And your building might have open courtyards and quads and a large welcoming entryway. Right, so that there's you know big doors coming in, and you have the widest sidewalk going up to the front door with the with the flowers around it, and maybe even if you're in the country, you have a nice long straight driveway coming up, you know, with you know the park-like appearance and all that sort of stuff. Those are common building features built into American buildings because we have so much space normally, or in the case of places like San Diego where we don't, we go underneath the building. But there's some common things that we do that we're not going to get away from. But we have to think of from a physical security uh, standpoint. And here's one way to look at it. So let's talk about those parking areas. We've talked about that single story building with the glass up front and the executive's office right there. And people, guests who we haven't screened, come right into our parking lot and they pull right up and they're parked, you know, five feet, 10 feet, sidewalk width from the executive office. I mean, they can, they can get out of their car and they can wave to the president of the company. But couldn't we improve physical security if we put our parking areas at a bit of a standoff? Suppose that visitor wants to do us harm and has a bomb in the car. Wouldn't we prefer to have visitor parking at least 150 feet or so, minimum, away from our building and specifically away from our executive offices? We're not that they're more important to protect necessarily, although in many cases they are from a financial and a stock perspective for a public company. But they are more the target. When someone wants to get at a company, they want to get at a company's executive. Cut off the head of the snake, right? But wouldn't it be better for physical security if we had a standoff distance for parking? What if we made executive offices in the interior of a facility? Let's give them a look at the interior courtyard, right? Build some gardens and have an interior courtyard and let them look at that. Visitors especially, though. Um, how about if we, instead of those nice flowers on the walkway, what if we put three-foot hedges up and we put two rows of them and in the middle we put a jersey bouncer of three feet? Jersey bouncer, those big concrete things you see on the highway when they're doing construction that they drop in so that if your car goes out of control, you hit that instead of go across and hit the other car. You could put those or bollards, and we'll talk about bollards. They are the the stands you see, the the pipe, if you will. It's usually about four or five, six inches around, and it's concrete or steel, and it's sunk in the ground, and it's a post that if you tried to hit it with a car, you would probably lose. If you had three-foot hedges and put bollards inside made of cement, nobody could see them inside there, but you'd have a protective barrier. As part of your environmental design, all you've done is replaced flowers with nice hedges, but inside that hedge, you've put a protection. Courtyards and quads going into buildings, right? When you have these courtyards, what about putting that, those same things or big heavy planters? Now you can use your flowers because you're going to put them in concrete precast planters that are about uh, eight feet long and three feet high and put those at the entryway into those quads so nobody could drive a car into them, right? Same thing with those large uh, welcoming entryways. If you go to just about any courthouse these days and you look there are normally one of two things large long steps going up to the front of the building or big planters outside or perhaps depending on the city a big piece of heavy artwork i've seen some metal statues and things like that those aren't just there for pretty they're there so nobody can drive a car through the front of the courthouse okay how about taking the uh that long straight driveway 
before it's put in and say, why don't we put these some turns in this? Why is that? Because on a straightaway, I can get my car and even my old truck, I can get up to at least 80, 85 miles an hour on a, um, on a long straightaway. But if it were a curving, winding kind of a driveway coming in, it would be both more scenic and I could never get really up over 40 miles an hour without feeling a little bit unsafe if it were really winding. So now if I decide to use a vehicle, and a lot of this is for vehicle protection, but there are other things you can do. You could put a big uh, pond in between the roadway and the front of your building. Now you know, for the most part, that anybody who's going to try to walk up and do you harm is going to walk around the pond. Very seldom does anybody use a boat attack to get buildings in the U.S., right? But if you have a pond with the fountains in it, looks pretty, you have prevented crime, or at least you've been able to better detect it and deter it through environmental design. That's what SEPTED is all about. And sometimes um, even SEPTED fails. Now, many of you probably know that the World Trade Center, prior to the attacks of 9-11, of um, had a previous bombing, a terroristic bombing, in 1993. They had underground parking under the towers. And this is just one shot of the results of the bombing of, of the World Trade Center underground parking in 93. The parking was generally accessed. Um, they didn't have protections, really, to prevent you from going in. There were many things they could have done. I mean, they could have had gated access and only allowed parking for the people who work in there, but that's a little impractical simply because there's so many people that work at the World Trade Center at the time that getting those vehicles in, even though many of them took public parking, there were a lot of vehicles. And to slow each one down with a rolling gate each time you came in, you had to, you know, put you in a code or show an ID or something and let you in one at a time would have backed traffic up that would have been unsustainable in New York City. But what they didn't really do is they didn't do anything to consider bomb mitigation, right? There was certainly a threat of terrorist activity uh, in the World Trade Center. And when it was built, they did very little to consider what's above it. This was underground parking. And simply put, the bomb wasn't big enough. This is a van loaded with, I forget the amount of explosives. It was, it was substantial, but it certainly wasn't big enough to really take out the floors above, which I think was probably the intent. Instead, the floor was a little weaker and it you know, went downward, as it appears here. But understand that through crime prevention, through environmental design, when the building was built, had they known about a potential terrorist threat, they could have put in uh, any kind of mitigation. They could have had a device that weighs vehicles when they came in. So today, if the technology was available then, which it, you know, it may not have been, but it was coming along even in the 90s, it would have measured the length and height and width of vehicles coming in through a series of cameras and said, this is a van. It is a, you know, a, uh, a Conaline van that should weigh somewhere around 4,000 pounds. But this one is coming in at 7,000 pounds. There's 3,000 pounds of something in here, and I should not. I should put up a gate that stops this vehicle before it gets too far and trap it in an area that's totally reinforced. So if there's a bomb blast, the only thing you're really going to do is scrape those bombers off the side of this thing. That could have been done. But again, at the time, perhaps the threat and risk wasn't there. But now that it is, you know that you need to consider the risk and the threat and the mitigations. Um, and in this particular case, um, it, had they had crime prevention through environmental design and known about the risk and the threat, they would have probably designed this building totally different. Could they have stopped the attacks on 9-11? Of course not. Nothing's going to stop an aircraft crashing into a building, unfortunately, other than preventing that aircraft from getting into that space in the first place. But in this particular case, this could have been not necessarily avoided, but it could have been mitigated to the point where it, do, where it did less harm to the building and killed less people. Now, when we talk about um, protections for buildings, um, the National Institutes of Building Sciences is really the basis for some building codes. And it says that, you know, you should have beyond parking management, you should have security features like cameras and lighting and uh, card reader access control and concrete filled bollards to protect uh, vehicle entry keypads in there, hydraulic lift wedges, all kinds of things like that. But none of this would have prevented what we just saw in that last picture because they didn't properly um, 
And in fact, the building could have been retrofitted and probably should have been because there was a terroristic threat in 1993 and we knew it, but the building didn't take any action to try to design in some additional controls. Also, what they forgot, and they were lucky that this bomb was just small enough, they didn't think about going up, right? So national codes will tell you that you should, and it says, um, they talk about this, but it's not part of a building code. So just understand that uh, even though the National Institutes of Building Sciences and um, fire prevention codes and all types of other national building codes do not necessarily mandate or even suggest in some ways, other than this, security for a building. So physical security is something that you need to do based on the threat, the risk, the vulnerabilities, and your physical security plan because it's not going to be built into a building. It's not going to be automatically assumed. You've got to make it happen. So what is it that you're making happen? Okay. Well, you're trying to deter, delay, detect, and defend a building. Okay. The word deny is also used, and I use it sometimes. The book, I believe, uses deny uh, a fair amount. It is a bit of a misnomer. I'm not so sure you can actually deny anybody access to anything. There are very few facilities and locations in this world that you are denied access to. I mean, you can be denied access to Fort Knox because they've got a tank, right? And it's aimed at your head and you're not getting in there, right? That's really the way they defend it, but they can deny you too. But most facilities, what you're trying to do is you're trying to deter the person, right? Deterrence just makes the target less attractive, right? There are many ways to deter people. That big pond out front may deter somebody from walking up that long driveway, may deter somebody from coming up because they can't really get to you easily, right? Barriers, fences, card readers on doors, good locks, they delay people. You can detect, detect them through alarms and cameras, right? Those are the two main reasons, but there are other ways to do it too. There are, but everything is really tied to an alarm. You could have ground drop sensors, which basically measure uh, footsteps on the ground. You could use microwave sensors and all kinds of other things, but to detect, you normally use alarms and cameras. And then you defend something and normally defend a building by a responding force, meaning a security force or police intervention. That is how you defend it. When you have detected it, you've delayed it and now you've detected it, right? You try to deter, they didn't listen to you. Somebody climbs your fence. So now your delay didn't work. It may delay them a little bit, but it, you now know and you've detected through your alarms and cameras somebody's in, you defend by calling the police uh, or sending your security force. So deter, delect, deter, delay, detect, defend, and we'll use deny as well, um, simply because it's in the book. But I think that you ought to be realistic and manage expectations when you tell anybody you can deny, because normally in a corporate setting, you don't have that um, that wherewithal to do that because your buildings have to be accessed for business reasons. So normally, you know, if you're going to deny, it's going to be something that people don't need to ever get into, and it's really not part of the business in that way. So let's take a bank. I don't mean go rob a bank. I mean, let's just take a bank as an example, right? You deter people from robbing of the bank because you don't display the cash, right? If the cash were out, and in the 1930s, there were a lot of bank robbers, right? We all know about the Bonnie and Clydes of the world, right? P Pretty Boy Floyd and John Dillinger, all bank robbers. Cash was displayed openly. It was because it was in an open cash box. You walked up to the teller and sure there may be uh, bars in front of you, but the cash was there, right? Cash is not open to dis displayed in a bank. And I, I, unless you've worked in a bank, I ask you, how much cash does a bank actually hold these days? And I will tell you that, you know, I'm probably older than most of you, and, and I don't know the answer to that. So much of our banking is done electronically. I don't know how much cash an individual bank branch will hold, <laughs> But I will tell you that in modern day uh, bank robberies, you normally see when they're successful, bank robbers get away with two to $4,000. So the bank can't be holding an awful lot or they've got other ways of holding it. But the cash is just not openly displayed and available. Okay, even though they seem to take a lot of money in. There could be guards in place. There could be cameras. And they're kind of a, a dual edge because when you walk into a bank, you know there are cameras and you look around and you'll see them everywhere. And some of them are covert, you can't see. But that's kind of a deterrent. You know, if you're going to rob a bank, um, 
you know, you're going to get your picture taken, right? So there's deterrence there. Now, the counters themselves are hardened. In a bank, you uh, you walk up and there'll be normally bulletproof glass, or at least down below, there'll be some hardening of that counter. It's wide enough, you know, jumping over the counter. There are still some bank branches that don't have that. But for the most part, there's something between you and the, ter the teller, right? The vaults are normally locked. And if they are open, you'll notice that there is a glass type door on it. It's known as a day gate. The day gate is locked. So it's just kind of a gee whiz thing for the bank. They're showing you the vault and they, they look like they need to get in and out. But that door is pretty hardened. That's not, that's not plate glass in that door when you can see through it, right? They have duress alarms. They have die packs for the bags. They have networked video, which means that you can't go in and shoot the cameras out and expect that that was going to erase what was on it, right? You can record on cameras. We'll get into that a lot uh, later on. Uh, or you can have a recording device at the bank, right? It would be a net VR in these days, right? Where the video all goes back and it's stored and it's recorded. But you can't go in and steal that and expect that the video didn't go anywhere because it's all going in the cloud. So it's networked video. Right, So we've deterred people. The cash isn't out there open to display. We might have guards in the bank. We'll have cameras that are visible. So we deterred them. We're saying this is not a good idea. We've delayed you because the, count the counters are normally hardened. The vaults are locked. There's a number of things that will keep you from getting to the money quickly. You could blow the vault, right? We've all seen it in the movies, and it probably is possible. It's done, right? It's been done. But it's hard to do, and it delays you, and it takes time. We would detect you because we have duress alarms. If you take a bag, bank bag full of money, there's a die pack. You open it up, you turn blue or orange, whatever it happens to blow at you, and you're not getting that off for a few weeks. And it also puts it all over the cash, so it's pretty hard to spend. There's network video, so it's not like you can run from the video or steal the recording device to take it with you. There were many uh, cases of that with gas stations. Gas stations have cameras, you know, convenience store gas stations. And normally in the old days, they were hooked to a VCR, and the VCR was right under the counter. There were a number of times when the thief would make them give them the tape before they left or just take the VCR with them, the whole thing. And there was no way to ever go back because there was nothing recorded on the camera itself. It was going back to that taping device. But now it's all networked and going to the cloud, so you can detect. And then you have a direct police notification when you push that duress alarm. And you've trained your tellers how to do that, so you've defended yourself. So the bank, in order to protect themselves, deters, delays, detects, and defends. They can't really deny because there are bank robberies, right? But they're using those four or five, depending if they could deny, right? to protect themselves. And it's important that you apply all of those elements when we talk about our, our security plan, because you're going to want to make sure that you can do all of those things, doing just one, right? If you can deter with not having a lot of cash out and having a guard and having cameras visible, and you can delay, right? And you can detect. You do all those things, but the thieves still get away because you don't have direct police notification and your people aren't trained how to use any of that, you haven't defended yourself. And if you take out any one of those elements and try to tell me that you would be as successful in protecting your bank, I will tell you that you are not. You really need to have every element. So, oh boy, did we go on a whirlwind and talk about a lot of stuff. But I think a lot of this stuff simply makes sense to you. Some of it is new concepts. Some of you may not have heard of SEPTED. And for criminal justice majors, it's pretty good to know that too. Because you may be asked by someone in the local community about, you know, how to set something up, how to protect a store that they're going to open. And, you know, what a great police officer that can come in and help with things like physical security to a shopkeeper. What a great way to do community policing, in my opinion. So it helps all the way around. But physical security has to be planned. You can't simply go and say, okay, and I've seen so many security managers do this. I have a new building. Let me throw up some cameras. Let me put some locks on the door and let me call it good. The cameras will be the ones that almost always get you in, in trouble. People think we throw up cameras, therefore we've protected the building, but they have no reason as to why the camera is there, no task and purpose, which we will talk about for every camera. And so it must be planned, and it has to be planned against the risk, the threat, and the vulnerability assessments. You take each finding, an item in those th assessments, and you add a feature, you add an action, you add a mitigation, is what we call it, right? You're going to add your mitigations, and you lower the risk. You address the threat, or you close the vulnerability. Sometimes you can't do it all. And sometimes for convenience, you may be able to 
to leave out some things because it might improve compliance. Think about those people and the HR people we talked about in that door. Sometimes when you leave stuff out and you compromise security ever so slightly, you are getting better compliance. And in the long run, your facility or your resource, your, your uh, asset is more secure because you've allowed some level of convenience. In order to choose the right mitigations, you really should visit the place to be protected. And that is one thing in this course we're not able to do. But I will tell you, even if the course were in, in person, we would not be able to do it. So, you know, it is what it is. But this is great practice because I will tell you, in my job, I design these all the time. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, a hobby of mine, quite frankly, that um, my people in the field should be able to do it. But most of them will say, you know, here's my plan. Go over it. And I tweak them because I enjoy doing this stuff, right? Um, and I don't go to most of them to look at that room. Many of them I've been to around the world, but I don't go there for specificity. Yeah, let's try that one again, huh? I don't go there for the reason of looking at the room that I'm going to protect. But I understand that I have good site plans. I actually use, design, you know, engineering drawings. And I call and ask questions about doors. What type of door? What's it made of, perhaps? Uh, those types of things. If I want to put a camera in a ceiling somewhere, I call and I say, what's that ceiling made of? Because if it's just a false ceiling with a, with a tile in it that's you know hanging down, it's not going to be secure enough in most cases to hook a camera to the way I want to connect it. I want to connect to a hard ceiling. I also have to worry about where the wiring goes. But if you can go there, that is the preferred method. Now, SEPTED is a great tool. And we will get into it a lot more when we talk about perimeter security and external security of our warehouse, which this week I will probably release the picture of for you, the aerial view. Um, you You don't need to do anything with it. You can just take a look at it because I will shoot you some information about this, this warehouse. And um, then you can start to add things as we talk about, we'll be talking about procedures first. Um, but as we get to perimeters and lights and locks and things, you'll be adding to this building what features you want to put in. And SEPTED will be a, a major portion of the discussion about barriers on the outside and perimeter protection. You can't really use it inside very much. Um, you know, it's it's hard to design things in, in the interior of a building that would prevent crime. However, um, sometimes you can put rooms in a certain place for that very purpose, like putting your executives away from the front of the facility where they might have more exposure, right? That is crime prevention through environmental design. If you put your, if you can build your executive offices, which are normally larger and, and, you know, have more features to them than other people's offices. But if you can have your designer build those into the back of the facility, so it overlooks the woods, then you won't have to worry about so much about a person pulling up a vehicle there and doing them harm in that fashion, right? You've, you've mitigated that one threat. Um, but it's a great external tool. Understand that building codes, and building standards don't address security. They, they just don't. And, you know, unlike our friends in safety and the safety management folks, I've had many in class, and we probably have some here. Um, you know, you have the national building codes and you have the national fire protection codes, uh, which very are very specific about what you need to do to protect people. There is no national code that is universally applied and legally applied when it comes to security, with the exception of some facilities that have uh, perhaps chemicals or materials or something with interest to terrorism. It's starting to come around for those. Other than that, you're kind of on your own. There are some some non-mandatory standards and references you can use, and we'll talk about those. But understand that physical security is not something you're going to go to the physical security, you know, guidebook and open up and simply just apply. You're going to need to be creative and you're going to need to be able to understand risks and threats and vulnerabilities to do protections. And finally, we talked about the concept of depth in defense, which is what our deter, delay, detect, defend is. Just remember that depth in defense means you're using all of these elements to try to make a a very holistic approach to your physical security. You're going to make the target less attractive. That could be by making it harder to get to. It could be by putting up signs. It could be by putting up a, um, you know, anything that is not a physical barrier, but just makes it look like you are less of a target. There's an old saying in physical security. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to to be um, perfect. You just have to be more perfect than the guy next door. 
right? And in some cases, it's, you know, it's the old adage of, um, you know, as I told my daughter, I took her hiking in Banff once and um, she was afraid of, of a bear coming in. And I told her, you don't have to run faster than the bear. You just have to run faster than me. And being an old fat man and her being in, you know, pretty good condition, uh, she can certainly outrun me because she works out like a fiend. So, you know, you don't have to be perfect, but you want to make your target less attractive in many ways. And that could be, again, that big pond out front. To you and me, it's more attractive looking. But to someone who wants to break into my facility, they got to swim across the pond to get there or come down the road, which I have covered with signage and visible cameras. They kind of look at it and they say, you know, this isn't worth it, right? It's almost the, the same as the sign that says, you know, this house protected by, you know, whatever security system. Um, and please don't ever put up a sign and don't put the system in, you know, that they call it a lick and stick in the game, um, where somebody puts a sign up and say they have a security system and they don't, the, uh, the real criminals know what to look for. They look for the sign, then they look for the, the box it goes to, and they look for the contacts and other things. And they'll know when you're lying and then they have a field day with you, but you make it less look, make it look less attractive. You want to make the attack tougher. You want to delay. That's the fencing and, and those, uh, for car bombs and things like that. It's those big planters, those types of delay factors. You want to be able to detect and know the attack that's happening right away, right? The bank with their duress buttons, the police know right away there's a problem at the bank, but maybe even before, because there are devices that you can use that will tell you what's happening uh, beforehand that can kind of get you geared up when, uh, when something's about to happen, right? And we'll talk about those. And then defend. You have to have a plan to respond and neutralize the situation because if all you say is, yep, I tried to stop them and I made it slower for them and then I knew they were doing it, but I didn't have any way to to do that, to, to, to stop it, right? I didn't have any way.